thank you, Ben, for the opportunity to present. Yeah, so uh, I'd like to tell you some of the ongoing work in my lab. Uh, and as many of you may know, my lab works uh, primarily uh, on this uh, phenomenon called RNA editing. Uh, I hope I can convince you that you know, some of the very fundamental discoveries of biology uh, is now really uh, revealing some of the possibilities for therapy. So I want to just you know make sure you know that RNA editing we're, we're talking about here is defined by the event that is categorized by this enzyme called ADAR, and that you heard briefly earlier, because nowadays there are just so many different <laughs> RNA editing events. Uh, but typically, historically, uh, in the literature, if you talk about RNA editing, we, we typically refer to uh, the ADAR mediated RNA editing. So ADAR uh, represents adenosine deaminase acting on RNA. Uh, somehow, uh, this enzyme can deaminate adenosine and to uh, a nucleotide called inosin. Uh, inosin looks like very much like a, a guanosin in terms of base pairing uh, with cytosin. So inosin, you know, will be read by uh, by ribosome, for example, as guanosin. So really, it's A to I or A to G change uh, in the R. So ADR is a double strand binding protein. You know, for that reason, you know, for any of the A to I editing events to happen, uh, that have to be uh, occurring in uh, double strand RNAs. So there are two types of double strand RNAs uh, that uh, where editing can happen. One is a sh pretty short uh, hairpin type of double strand RNAs. And so in this type of double strand RNAs, typically what you see is something called site-specific RNA editing. So you can you can you can you can you can see in this particular example, uh, the double strand RNA may be a bit more than twenty base pairs, uh, and somehow among you know, all more than 10 adenosines uh, in this uh, particular hairpin, one particular adenosine uh, is specifically and highly edited. So there's a lot of interesting biology here that somehow uh, gives rise to this you know, high specificity and, efficient, uh, and efficiency of editing, uh, particularly in this short hairpin uh, with size specific editing. The other category of Editing happens in very long double strand arrays. Uh, in, in fact, that's the vast majority of editing. We have millions of editing sites in a given human cell. So the left version, we only have maybe a couple hundred examples like that. It's actually not very common, but it does occur. So the, the reason uh, the right version, uh, this very long double strand arrays, I hear I show, you know, most of them are actually formed by uh, inverted arrow repeats uh, in, in humans. The ALU is a, you know, repeating humans and primates. Uh, so 10% of human genome is ALU repeat. And uh, we have more than 1 million copies of ALUs. So if you can imagine, you've got two ALUs that are inverted in the same transcript, uh, for example, in the 3 prime UTR, sometimes in the introns uh, of a particular transcript, they will fall back to form very long double strand rights. Uh, these ALUs are typically 300 base pairs long. Of course, there are many other forms of double strand eyes, and some of, the, some of that can be even longer. So these long double strand eyes will be promiscuous to editing, meaning multiple adenosine to innocent editing events uh, would uh, occur in the same transcript. So I, I want to just give you probably focus on the part one, uh, that is, you know, now we know this kind of naturally occurring short double strand eyes that can be edited uh, specifically and efficiently. So then, you know, uh, we're trying to figure out how to mimic uh, what this you know, happens in nature, uh, maybe for programmable RNA editing. Uh, the second part, if I if I have time, I will tell you. Uh, essentially, we, we try to understand the function of these editing events for long double strand primarily formed by repeats. Uh, by understanding that fun these functions, uh, we really think there are some very interesting, exciting therapeutic uh, applications. Okay, so in nature, that's what we see. Uh, the idea for in engineering or just programmable RNA editing, that's very straightforward. Because let's say you have a you know, MRA or you know, linear uh, single-stranded MRA with adenosine, you want to edit. Maybe that adenosine is a point mutation you know, driven by a G2 mutation that causes a disease. As an example, uh, what you can do is to deliver some kind of antisense 
RA, you know, or sometimes we call antisense oligo, but really here is an RA oligo uh, that can form an artificial double strong RA with a target. So when that happens, uh, you know, the ADR, and we even showed in this paper this is below, the endogenous ADR enzyme, which by the way, is very highly expressed in pretty much every human cell that can be recruited to make specific A2I or A2G changes. So this is really through a very close collaboration with Torsten Schaffel's lab uh, that really you know, pioneered a lot of ADR mediated RA uh, uh, editing. Okay, so, so we've even you know, co-founded a company uh, essentially focused on uh, using endogenous ADR enzyme uh, uh, to make specific uh, A2I or A2G changes. We call RA base etiquette at this com company called ARA. That's also my uh, disclosure uh, conflict. But the work I'm going to present to you uh, uh, is pretty much done only in, in our labs, but not in the company. Okay, so just maybe a big picture. You know, if you think about RA editing, I, I try to you know promote here. Of course, we know there is a lot of exciting uh, developments for other types of modalities in terms of genetic medicine. You know, you heard a lot this morning about uh, DNA editing, uh, primarily CRISPR-based, which is really versatile. Uh, it can do all, all kinds of different things, uh, you know, with different versions of CRISPR and Cas enzymes. Uh, but I would say that you know, till now, of course, there, there's also exciting uh, clinical developments. You know, you, you heard sickle cell disease, uh, the FDA approval that is really exciting. Uh, but perhaps you know, for many other indications, uh, you know, how to overcome uh, the safety and the toxicity uh, can still be a major topic uh, in the CRISPR. Uh, field, particularly if we think about some common diseases. For you know, RA therapy, such as SRA, uh, we know there are you know, quite a few drugs uh, approved by FDA now. Uh, so really, they, they demonstrated uh, you know, the very high safety profile. Uh, but of course, we know in general, the RA therapy, uh, the SRA programs uh, will really silence expression. There's no editing capability. So what we hope to do uh, with this modality of course, our editing capability may be more limited to a particular type, that is A2G, uh, but maybe we can you know, take advantage of the RNA therapy uh, that is a very you know, high safety profile. Uh, the reason we have higher safety profile uh, may be driven by the fact you know, for both RNA therapy and RNA editing, uh, we take advantage of the endogenous cellular machinery. Uh, you know, for, for SRA, that will be the risk machinery. For RNA editing, that will be the ADR machinery. So yeah, so then if you look into you know, the nature versus engineering, that in the current engineering version, essentially we use almost perfect antisense sequence to target the MRI you want to edit. But if you look at the left, there are, there are actually a lot of irregularities in the double MRI. That, you know, that includes a lot of wobble-based pairing, you know, mismatches, et cetera. So somehow uh, these irregularities are really important to guide the very high specificity and efficiency for it. So one of the things uh, we've been trying to do in, the, in my lab is to figure out how can we mimic nature uh, to, do, uh, to design better antisense oligo so that we have better drugs uh, in the future. So the idea is very simple. You know, we can really you know, kind of fuse the target sequence you want to edit uh, with uh, the antisense anti sequence, but with kind of random um, uh, variants uh, designed uh, so that we can make a library with all kinds of different variants. And so then you know, if we just transfect that con construct or the library uh, into some human cell lines where we know ADR is expressed, and then we can simply sequence the entire transcript uh, that contains both the editing side and uh, the, the variants we're, we're introducing. So then of course we're looking for the variants uh, that will give us in you know, a higher levels of editing levels, essentially the ratio of A to G will be lower, right? There will be more Gs that will indicate a higher editing levels by next gen sequencing approach. So that way we can read a screen, you know, tens of thousands of different variants quite easily. So this is just one example we show here. So the red line indicates if you don't make any variants, just the, with a prototype, essentially almost perfect anti sense. And in this case, we may achieve somewhere around maybe 16% uh, editing levels. Uh, but of course, if you make uh, changes, you know, introducing all kinds of variants, 
actually most of the variants were even lower the editing levels. Of course, that's not what we want on the left. But on the right side, we also see quite a few variants that will give rise to much higher editing levels. Some of them, some of that can even approach uh, 100%. So these are the ones that we really uh, want to identify because these will be uh, optimized anti sense sequences. And we not just that example, we actually have done that for 20 different disease relevant targets. So from left to right, uh, we have you know, different types of uh, you know, sequence contacts. I forgot to mention earlier, you know, for ADAR, it, it likes double strong eyes, although we don't know much about the irregularities of the structural features. But also in addition, people know that you know, right, you know, like one base upstream and one base downstream of the adenosine that is editable, uh, there is a very weak motif. Uh, so you know, people have some ideas, you know, what kinds of motifs are more editable or more favorable uh, than others. For example, you have a G upstream of A that's considered uh, not to be uh, editable. So these are the ones uh, that will uh, make it harder uh, to be edited. So for that reason, it may be more important uh, for you to optimize the sequence if that particular target is really uh, of high interest uh, for patients. So here we can see from left to right, you know, the prototype, obviously, you know, for the for the unfavorable uh, sequence context, we, we typically have lower editing levels. Uh, uh, on the right, uh, we typically see higher uh, editing levels for the prototype. But in all cases, uh, we see, uh, you know, more uh, edited events uh, by optimizing uh, the, the variants. So these are the variants uh, we're trying to identify. But of course, you know, we found, you know, these variants are very interesting. We you know, for different targets, we find different types of features, but we also have some very interesting findings that suggest, you know, some of the recurring themes occur uh, in different targets. And so that suggests there could be some general rules. I just gave you, you know, some of the examples, although there's a lot of analysis work that, that is still ongoing. And for example, we, we, we found that for a particular target, and, uh, you know, in our variants, we can have single variant or double variants. So one of the questions we're asking, you know, is there an additive effect uh, between two independent variants uh, for, for a given target? Uh, that seems to be the case. Uh, we, 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 we simply by, you know, summing up uh, the two independent variants uh, and have a predicted full change of editing. And then we also have measured uh, full change with two variants. So that you, you can see a very nice correlation uh, for theme one. Uh, for theme two, you know, for a given target here, uh, we, we, we see for multiple variants, there, there seem to be you know, some hotspots, uh, you know, meaning you know, certain positions with changes in different types of variant combinations. We, we keep seeing them. And that kind of suggests certain positions might be really preferred by ADAR with certain changes. And the theme number three is that you know, we even find some of the you know, cost spots can occur in multiple targets. You know, for example, for target A and target B, you can see uh, that particular position uh, on the five prime end uh, of the denison uh, seems to be uh, kind of preferred uh, with certain types of changes, uh, similar for type C and, and D, uh, target C and, C and D. Okay, so another thing that we did was just to, to show if we combine the optimized sequence and the chemical modifications that is mostly carried out uh, in Torsen's lab. Uh, for example, in, in the past, we already have this chemical to modify oligos without really considering uh, the, uh, you know, the, the sequence optimization. But now if we put all these things together, you know, we ask whether we can have a kind of synergistic effect or combinatorial effect uh, between the, this version we call Azole version 16 uh, that is only chemically modified uh, version 16M uh, will be both chemical uh, chemistry modified and sequence optimized. And that's what we see if we, you know, deliver, you know, different doses of that, that chemical to modify oligo with or without the sequence optimization, we can see particularly at the lower dose, uh, we can have up to 40% of the increase with sequence optimization. And that uh, obviously is just in vitro experiment. Uh, you know, we we, uh, we have some ongoing work uh, in, in, in vivo as well. So lastly, for this part, I just want to quickly show you one example like for in vivo. Uh, there's this disease uh, that many companies are, are pursuing called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. 
Uh, this disease is a particular interesting for amenable for RNA editing because almost all patients uh, will have the same mutation, that is a G2A mutation, that will change a single amino acid. Through the single amino acid change, the, there will be uh, there will be a you know protein misfolding uh, for this protein called subpina. It's the AAT protein uh, in subpina gene. Uh, so this misfolding will lead to the fibrosis uh, in the liver because this transcript uh, is pretty much only expressed in the liver. However, you know the Y type protein that is produced in the liver has to go through the bloodstream to the lung because uh, this protein turns out to be very important to have certain functions in the lung. Without that, uh, patients may have you know, COPD-like uh, symptoms. So you can imagine for patients with that particular mutation, uh, they can have both liver fibrosis and COPD-like phenotypes. So, you know, for that, and of course, you know, if you can have a, a, a modality that can fix uh, this G2 mutation uh, by making A to G changes, you're going to produce wild type protein. Uh, you know, the hope is that that will you know, really re resolve the liver disease and the lung disease uh, at the same time. So in our proof concept uh, that we carry out for over, almost two years ago now, uh, so we you know, use this humanized AAT mutant mouse model and just use like, a nuclear nanoparticle to, to package the chemical and modified oligo uh, we designed. And then you know, we have you know, even different versions here. You know, I, you know, there's version 16 on the right. Uh, you know, we measure two different things. One is just to check what's the editing level, right? So the, obviously, the idea you have 100% editing level. But in our hands, we typically see uh, there's uh, almost up to 50% of editing level uh, when you have better designed uh, oligo, that is version 16. Uh, on the other hand, you can also measure the the AAT concentration in the blood, uh, you know, using a, a antibody, uh, you can do that. So the red bar uh, indicates the therapeutic threshold. I'm not going to get into too much of detail. So you can imagine, you can, you can, you can see that uh, we uh, can achieve well above the therapeutic uh, threshold in terms of the amount of AAT protein, uh, essentially what type of AAT protein that can be released into uh, the bloodstream. Uh, that is very encouraging. Uh, that obviously there is a lot of work. And happening in a company uh, as well. All right. So do I still have time? Uh, yeah. So maybe just for the next couple of minutes, I, I quickly tell you uh, almost very different aspect from the part one, but of course it's all ADAR related. So as I mentioned, there you know vast majority of the double strands in our in our cells are formed by very long uh, double strands, often repeats. So the question then is, you know. Why do these non-double strands need to be edited? You know, they we see a ton of editing events, but then maybe one question: Do they have to be edited? Now, if so, why do they have to be edited? So, without getting into too much of the data, uh, let me just tell you: Now we know that these long double strands often formed by repeats. They really have to be edited uh, by a particular enzyme called AR1, one of the AR enzymes, AR1. So. Without, without being edited by ADR1, these long double strand eyes will resemble the features of viral double strand eyes. You know, we know when, when we have viral infection, you know, even single strand RNA virus, like coronavirus, they can be replicated in the host uh, that will form very long double strand eyes. So then there's this enzyme called MDA5, which is RNA helicase that will recognize the pattern of these very long double strand eyes in the cytosol. So that would you know, form a filament to trigger the downstream interferon response. So that is really, you know, MDA5 is really a very important antiviral uh, double strand sensor. However, so we have a ton of cellular long double strand eyes that can also potentially trigger the unwanted MDA5 activation. Now for that reason, the ADR editing is really critical uh, to safeguard the cellular long double strand eyes. Without being edited, these cellular long double strand eyes will resemble uh, viral double strand as, as I said, uh, so that MDA5 as a you know, pattern recognition receptor will recognize that uh, as viral non-self to trigger uh, interferon response. So if you have that happens in a chronic fashion, uh, uh, that can really be a problem uh, leading to inflammation in many of the uh, immune-related uh, contexts. 
All right, so the key data, let me just show you one maybe key data is that you know, many years ago, we collaborated uh, with Carl Walkley's group in Australia. What we did first was to make a mouse without editing by ADR1, so just you know, changing a single uh, amino acid that is cri critical for the editing uh, act activity. Then the mouse would die before birth. Uh, Striking A, now if you remove MPA5, the stop sensor, sensor, the, the mouse can live like a normal lifespan. So that really says that cellular non double shrines without being edited will only activate MDA5. But by the way, we and others also try to rescue the ADR mutant mice with many other sensors. None of the other things can have a good rescue at all. Pretty much only MDA5 can rescue, but not just the rescue to uh, adulthood, it's also rescued to full lifespan. Uh, that is pretty uh, striking result. That's the reason uh, that not to. Uh, the you know the, the the mechanism I list on the on the left. So that was mouse genetics. For human genetics, it's also very you know interesting. You know, people have identified uh, in some very rare autoimmune diseases, uh, such as something called icardiac tear syndrome or AGS. You know, eight or one loss of function mutations uh, in the same type of disease, uh, which is a monogenic disease. People also found MDA five gain of function mutations in different patients. So you can. You know, that totally makes sense, echoing uh, the mechanism uh, we and others uncovered. So either way, it are loss of function or MDF gain of functions, uh, these would uh, really elevate uh, interferon response. So the recent work uh, that we carried out uh, in the lab, uh, really done by a former postdoc, Ching Li, who actually recently started his own lab at Penn, uh, what we showed uh, in this paper, uh, I don't have time to go into the details, but essentially what we found is that in common autoimmune and inflammatory disease patients, uh, we, they probably cannot afford having mutations in ADR1 or MDA5 because that would be too penetrant. But just because you have perfect ADR doesn't mean you have perfect editing. Uh, you know, these patients could be enriched with genetic risk variants as defined by the GWAS studies. Uh, these genetic risk variants may collectively impair the editing of the double strong eyes nearby. So then, Collectively, these insufficiently edited double strong eyes uh, can really trigger uh, potentially uh, the MDA5 mediated interferon response, and that may you know, infiltrate immune cells to attack these interferon producing cells. So for that reason, you know, we have there's just a lot of ideas you know, from the field to target this particular uh, ADR1 uh, MDA5 axis. Uh, so you can imagine, you know, ADR and, and MDA5 can become very interesting therapeutic targets uh, because uh, you can have ideas to, you know, for example, activate the double sensing pathway uh, so that uh, you can really, you know, use that uh, to activate in any in any new response. Uh, maybe a, a very good approach for uh, cancer immunotherapy kind of approaches. Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, if you dampen the stop strong sensing pathway, that can be a great approach uh, to treat um, maybe many of the autoimmune or inflammatory diseases. So this is just really, you know, if you compare that with many other parallel pathways uh, in the therapeutic development fields, many people are very familiar with the CGAS thing, DNA sensing pathway. There are many, many companies pursuing uh, CGAS and STING as targets for both cancer and autoimmune disease. Uh, we think uh, these stop strong sensing pathways what deserve uh, a lot of attention uh, in the future as well. So with that, I, I really hope I have convinced you uh, this you know, kind of bizarre biology called RNA editing by ADR enzyme with two different categories of kind of types of double strong substrate, and each one of which uh, uh, is leading to some very interesting uh, therapeutic ideas uh, for short double strong eyes. Now we have this RNA-based editing as a, as a platform or modality uh, that really can uh, go after many of the uh, diseases. I gave you one example of a rare disease, but of course, we also think about some common indications uh, that uh, can potentially be amenable to this type of a modality. For the long double strong eyes, uh, now you know, through this uh, fundamental mechanistic studies, uh, we uncovered this, we call it one MDA5 axis. That leads to a lot of therapeutic ideas for treating cancer and auto inflammatory diseases. So, with that, uh, I, I really want to thank. Uh, my amazing group, uh, I mentioned some of the people uh, uh, along the talk, for many others uh, contribute to the work as well. So for the for the first, first part, this is really through very close collaboration with Thorsten Schaffel's lab. And 
Well, the second part, it really started uh, with Carl Walkley School. And of course, we also got a lot of help uh, from uh, Stephen Montgomery and Jonathan Pritchard and Jimmy Almada School uh, in Fudan. And also I have Disclosure. And also I want to shout out to, of course, most of our work is funded by NIH. Uh, we also have some generous support from Stanford Internal uh, IMATIC Program and the SPARC Program. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to answer any questions.